Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian at the Center for a New American Security in Washington, D.C., where we're meeting with Julie Smith, who is a former National Security Advisor to Vice President Joe Biden, or former Vice President Joe Biden, depending on when you're watching this. Uh, Julie, you've put together a comprehensive report on U.S.-Russia relations. Obviously, that's one of the very hot topics that everybody is is uh, is, is talking about uh, now. Uh, you spent a career in national security. You're with uh, Beacon Strategies, uh, aside from being a fellow here at, at, at CNN. AS. But tell us a little bit about, you know, what are the big issues that have to be resolved between these two countries? What's the kind of relationship we have to have? And what do you find disturbing about some of the comments that the president-elect or the 45th president, again, depending on when people are watching this, has been making about Russia? Well, Russia has been acting very aggressively towards the United States and in its immediate neighborhood ever since Putin assumed power in 2012. And so the big question for the incoming administration is how do they want to approach that? It seems like the incoming president, President Trump, wants to somehow start anew and create maybe a Russian reset 3.0 uh, with Putin. And the question there is, what are we trading? I mean, we know what the Russians want, right? So we they want us to live sanctions. They want us to stop asking them to u leave Ukraine. They would love to see U.S. force posture leave Europe. Uh, and they'd love to find a way for us to work on the same side in Syria. The question is, what do we get in return for that? Would Russia, for example, agree to no longer moving forward with strategic communications plans aimed at fueling stability and dividing Europe uh, across the, its neighboring states? Would Russia agree not to in interfere in the German and French elections? Would Russia, in fact, really fight ISIL in Syria, which to date, we haven't seen much effort in that regard. And what more should we expect from the Russians in terms of their involvement in the brewing crisis uh, inside Ukraine? And I think we don't have answers to that. I think we have to wait and see exactly what the intent of this president is, what his expectations are. He keeps saying he wants Russia to help us fight ISIL, but I think it needs to be more than that. And our European allies are going to be anxious to hear what this actually looks like, assuming he's going to cut some sort of grand bargain. Um, if you listen to Samantha Powers, uh, you know, in all the interviews that she did uh, before departure, she made absolutely clear that the notion of dropping sanctions uh, preemptively would be bad. Uh, obviously, and you mentioned obviously the leverage point on you know what does the United States and its allies get in return? What are the implications for the United States dropping sanctions unilaterally on Russia? And what sort of a signal is it going to send our allies in in Europe that committed to a sanctions regime that we sort of forced them into to a degree? At first, they didn't want to do that. Well, it's ironic because in essence, we've been pushing the Europeans for several years now not to go soft on sanctions. We've heard statements across the European continent by Europe leaders that they have an interest in lifting sanctions, at least some of them. This has been incredibly tough for them to maintain. They felt it more economically than we have. And so to have a U.S. president come in and suddenly say, it's okay, we're going to go forward and lift these, I think will divide Europe first and foremost, because some countries will not want to lift the sanctions. Some will breathe a sigh of relief and say, thank God, because these have been really hard to maintain. But it really puts the transatlantic relationship in chaos. And and shows that we will be divided, and it will play into Putin's hands because that's exactly what he wants to see. I think the one thing people forget also is sanctions are not like a light switch. You don't turn them on and off. So let's say we pull down the sanctions even unilaterally here in the United States. Let's also say that in a year's time, Trump decides that Putin's not actually our friend, and we have some real differences, and we want to send a signal back to him for something else that Putin has done. We will find it incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to lay on a sanctions regime that resembles anything that we have today with our European allies. And I think the next administration really needs to keep that in mind. Do you think one of the other things the Russians are apparently asking for is, quote, strategic breathing room on our border? Um, obviously, the European Reassurance Initiative is very important. U.S. troops are now in Norway. Um, U.S. troops are in the Baltics now, as, w as well as in Poland. Um, what, are, what are the implications if the United States eases off that or starts a movement within the alliance to back those troops out of those countries? 
If we saw a situation where the Trump administration were to come in and roll back the European Reassurance Initiative, which is a commitment of about $3.4 billion towards European security, and let's say the administration also decides to pull out some of the posture we've just put into Central and Eastern Europe, I think, again, it creates enormous anxiety among our allies, particularly among those in Central and Eastern Europe. They are living this each and every day. They face challenges from Russia, some we can't even imagine, in terms of the acts of intimidation. They have ships occasionally showing up in their waters. They have planes showing up in their airspace. They occasionally have cyber attacks. Even the Swedes have had incidents um, with cyber attacks, their media experienced a blackout at one point. Uh, so I think we have to be very careful about the signal we would send. My advice would be, if you want to cut a grand bargain, if that's your intent, talk to the Russians again about the parameters of the deal, but don't make any rash moves on U.S. posture and maintain the transatlantic unity we need by maintaining those investments in Central and Eastern Europe. We've found, we the United States, one of the things we found is if the U.S. puts forward an investment, it's much easier to get other Europeans to contribute. The fact that we have other European countries now deploying forces to the Baltics is in part because the United States decided to do the same thing. You can't simply say, over to you, you do it without us. It's not going to fly. So I would really proceed with caution if I were the next administration. It, obviously, but the president-elect or the president, depending on when we're talking about uh, the uh, uh, Mr. Trump has said that, uh, you know, suggested the idea of a nuclear deal, right? At one point was we can rearm. Um, folks found that statement a little bit on the alarming side. And then it was, no, 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 you know, let's, let's strike a grand nuclear bargain. Um, is that something the Russians are even vaguely interested in? given how much investment they have been putting into their strategic nuclear forces over the past couple of years? So you'll remember that in the first term of President Obama's, uh, he was able to pursue this Russian reset with President Medvedev, and they were able to get New START, a major arms control agreement signed, which was a shining achievement of the bilateral relationship at the time. Once Putin came into office, the message that we received when I was at the White House in 2012 and 2013, just after our election and Russia's election, was that the Russians had zero interest in pursuing additional arms control agreements or anything in the area of nuclear security. And so that area of cooperation, which seemed quite rich early on in Obama's tenure, was then essentially taken off the table. The question now is whether or not Putin would make some new accommodation and express an interest in that with a President Trump as part of perhaps a bigger deal on our relationship going forward. But again, I'm very skeptical that they have a genuine interest in that. They've been modernizing their military. They've said a lot of interesting and new things about their nuclear weapons in various doctrines, strategies, white papers. That strategic leaks. Strategic leaks. Uh, and I think as a result, uh, I think for them, they want to maintain as much control over those weapons and not see additional cuts. That's my guess. I would be really, truly shocked if we saw any major movement in this area under the new administration. Do you think, um, at, you know, one of the comments that the president-elect um, have been most vexing to people, uh, you know, as an, as an Atlanticist and somebody who's followed uh, and studied NATO, you know, was the obsolete question, and then it went away, and, and then after the election, he called Jens Stoltenberg and said, well, you know, we in, agree on the enduring importance of the alliance, but NATO nations have to spend more, and the mission has to become more relevant, more counterterrorism focused. Uh, the NATO alliance has shown itself to be very resilient, and just very recently said, well, the NATO alliance is obsolete, and its missions have to have to change again to focus on counterterrorism. From your standpoint, as, as somebody who studied in Germany, is, is, a, is a NATO file, you know, is the alliance uh, obsolete? Has it been adopting properly? And what are the implications if the alliance itself tools itself into a counterterrorism alliance, which was part of the challenge, right? For a couple of years, it became so focused on Afghanistan, and nations who were within NATO got so focused in Iraq and became counterterrorism focused. You could argue that that strategic deterrence that the alliance is supposed to present had decayed. Yeah, NATO is imperfect. It's a rusty, creaky, old institution that's uh, several decades old. 
but it is absolutely indispensable. And as Mattis said in his confirmation hearing, if we didn't have NATO, we'd have to invent it. No other organization in the world, in my mind, has done as much to adapt to the changing security landscape as the NATO alliance. We asked the alliance to go out of area. Early on in the 90s and early 2000s, we asked the alliance to help us on counterterrorism missions, to become more expeditionary, to forget about some of its missions at home. It delivered. We asked it to conduct counterpiracy operations at sea off the coast of Somalia. It did that. We've asked it to expand its partnerships and train countries around the world. It did that. Uh, so basically any request that countries and members have thrown at it, it's found a way to adapt. And I think NATO has proved itself to be a useful organization in the broader fight against terrorism. Some Europeans, though, don't view it to be the only institution. Don't forget that the EU plays a role in that regard as well, particularly as the Europeans view counterterrorism through a law enforcement and intelligence sharing lens, which really takes you more to the EU, where some of their natural um, kind of skill sets apply. So yes, we can, of course, make NATO more relevant to today's challenges. We're always trying to do that. But I think to call the alliance obsolete, not just once, but now twice, at two points, both during the transition and during the campaign, really issues um, a, a, a really almost a death blow to transatlantic unity and doesn't make the alliance want to adjust and respond and be reactive and help the United States address a number of security challenges, it almost creates some drift. And um, it really hurts morale for the men and women that are working at the NATO alliance. And so I, I would hope that we could start out on a positive foot and that the Trump team would help uh, learn more about what NATO has done. We've had several iterations of what NATO has done since the fall of the Berlin Wall, and it's nothing short of breathtaking. Could we do more on defense spending? Absolutely. Uh, the trends are generally moving in the right direction, but you always want to hold Europeans' feet to the fire on that. Um, and we'll keep reforming NATO to fit today's security challenges. But I think to come out with such disparaging remarks early on really doesn't set us off on the right foot going forward. Let me ask you um, about that. I mean, obviously, you know, you spend enough time in the White House to know how policy is made. And in several cases, um, you know, if you listen to some of the statements that Rex Tillerson has made during his confirmation hearings and Jim Mattis and others are very reassuring. You know, um, uh, Nikki Haley said very reassuring things about Russia being the challenge and, and the issue, you know, one of the biggest threats that we have to deal with. Uh, Jim Mattis was very clear on that uh, as well. But if you look at it from an Obama administration lens, there were things that almost the entire administration was saying, whether they were things about Libya or whether they were things about Syria, that the president specifically was not comfortable with. And he is ultimately the man in charge. Um, could this be a situation where the president's mind, the new president's mind, is, is and may stay in a very different place from the rest of his administration? And what does that mean, ultimately? Well, this is the question of the hour. We do not know how we're going to square the circle between what we're hearing from the cabinet secretaries and what we've heard to date in their confirmation hearings and what we're hearing from Trump himself. Uh, and so the real question on the table is whether or not Trump likes to be provocative and will continue to throw out very edgy, uh, kind of provocative tweets, but truly enable his cabinet secretaries to do their job and let them carry on the tradition of working with our NATO allies? Or will it be a little bit of both? Is it going to be occasionally the president will break China and ruffle feathers to mix metaphors uh, with our European allies, and then the cabinet secretaries have to kind of play catch up and try to translate all of that uh, for our allies? We just don't know. We really don't know at this point how this government is going to function. Obama was criticized for having a White House that was quite controlling uh, by many on the outside. And so the question is, will we see the same under Trump or will we see the opposite where actually Mattis and Tillerson do their own thing to committed Atlanticists and the relationship carries on just fine? This is the fundamental question that many of us here in Washington are asking, but also all of our European allies are asking themselves right now. Let me ask you one last thing about the EU. Um, obviously, 
you know, it's sort of funny how you have to remind people of history, you know, why the EU was created. The EU was created to avert another third destructive European war, right. to bind nations so economically together that ultimately everybody was, had no interest in uh, uh, fighting. Brexit fanned flames of distrust. Uh, many prominent Brexiteers said, you know, France is Britain's natural enemy. Uh, the Germans are untrustworthy. That didn't go well in, in, in Paris or in Berlin, where there was a sense that, look, you know, despite jokes that we always make as Europeans among one another, that we're all really on the same team. Now it looks like, you know, in France, you may have new leadership, obviously, the, the right, there's hope that Fillon beats Le Pen, obviously. Uh, but there are also worries now in Germany about whether Angela Merkel stays in charge as, 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 as Germany's sort of superwoman and anchor, uh, as Germany is, of, 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 of the EU. How important is the EU? How dangerous is its risk? And why is that union so critically important for U.S. security, but also economic prosperity? Well, let's not forget that the European... Given, given in part what, what uh, Mr. Trump has said regarding, you know, that, you know, couldn't care less about what happens to the EU. Well, we should care what happens to the EU. Um, I think many of us need to recall that the European project was in part an American project. We are not a member of the EU. We don't get a voice or a veto or a vote. Uh, but it's of critical importance to us because it has been been a contributing factor to stability on the European continent for many, many decades. And in part, the Marshall Plan laid the way to bring the stability on which they could begin building the European Union. And we have always supported that project. We roll our eyes. We get frustrated. We have disagreements. We call it too bureaucratic, too slow moving. But at the end of the day, just from a trade and economic perspective, the benefits are enormous on both sides. And as always, there's room for improvement. But I think we would find that if we saw the EU collapse, we would have a weaker set of European partners that would be willing to do less in the world, that would be uh, not as reliable as partners to the United States. And the transatlantic unity, which is so critical to pushing back on many challenges around the world, would start to fray. And so I would hope that we can help in any way we can preserve the European project. Uh, we don't, again, get a vote, but there's a lot we can do to try to help them support this project going forward. And I would note that what's happened so far, the tweets and the interviews coming out of Trump Tower seem to be moving in the other direction, that there's some appetite by President Trump and others to see this project fail. And I, I think it's almost a certainty that we would live to regret it. I think even among many in the UK, they're regretting the decision to move forward with Brexit. And we'll watch the consequences of that in the years to come. But I think it would be a huge mistake in general to wish for the EU to go away. Julie, thanks very much for spending so much time with us. And your report on the future of uh, U.S.-Russia relations that you wrote with Adam Twardowski is up on your guys' website and, and also on our website. Thanks so much again. Thank you.